Hey everybody. Um, for those of you who subscribed for photography related videos, don't worry, more of those will be coming. This video, however, we'll be talking about computer water cooling. In particular, we'll be talking about uh, pumps, pump performance, and the relationship between head pressure flow uh, and um, uh, the pressure drop incurred by components in the system and how all of these things can be factored together uh, to estimate flow rate through a system with a given pump. It sounds complicated, but it's really actually pretty easy. The first thing that you usually run across when you're researching water cooling pumps uh, are the manufacturer's maximum flow and maximum head pressure specifications. These two pieces of information basically give you the two extreme ends of the pump's performance curve. It gives you the maximum head pressure at zero flow and the maximum flow rate at zero head pressure. Uh, but to understand what these, what these mean and what the entire curve in between these two points means, you first have to understand the relationship between head pressure and flow rate. It's an inverse relationship. So the higher the operating head pressure, the lower the flow rate through the system. And obviously the reverse is true as well. The lower the operating head pressure, the higher the flow rate through the system. Um, and I'll demonstrate that real quick here with this setup, which it's a mess, but it'll get the point across. Uh, over here, I have a very large flow meter. <laughs> um, and next to it, a gauge, a uh, pressure gauge that's attached to this bleed line here. Um, and this gauge will show you the operating pressure of the pump, so the head pressure that it's currently operating at and the flow meter will obviously display the flow rate through this whole system. Now it's important to note that there are uh, fittings and lots of tubing and a water block in the system, so uh, the flow rate will probably only be wide open in the ballpark of about eh, 2.6 gallons a minute or so, um, and that's just because this is a very powerful pump. So let's get the pump turned on. There we go, there's still a little bit of air and everything. Um, but you can see here, pump went on, the gauge is showing, uh, yep, that's about two and a half, 2.6-ish gallons a minute. And the pump is currently operating at about eh, 13 and a half PSI. Um, now, if I start closing the valves, the control valves that I have on here, you'll note the float in the flow meter starts to descend. Uh, and it does so kind of slowly until I get to the needle valve over here. But as I close off the needle valve, it'll descend much more rapidly, and you'll see the pressure gauge increasing very quickly as I approach uh, deadhead, which is basically when we reach zero flow maximum head pressure. You'll see the gauge go off scale high, which it should be doing right... Yep, there we go. So right there. This pump is capable of producing far more pressure than this gauge can actually read, but this allows you to see the relationship between flow and pressure. They're also kind of analogous to uh, voltage and current in electrical circuit. Uh, flow obviously being uh, analogous to current and uh, voltage to pressure. And you can see here I'm opening the valve up again, flow rate increases, operating pressure starts to drop as the valves open. So let's start, uh, let's go and take a look at a hypothetical pump performance curve. Uh, and I'll walk you through exactly what it's trying to tell you. Here we have a hypothetical pump performance curve. We have pressure in PSI on the y-axis and flow rate in gallons per minute on the x-axis. Now the units may be different depending on the manufacturer or the source of the data, but it still reads basically the same way. As I mentioned earlier, typically when you start shopping for pumps, the first two pieces of information you'll encounter are the maximum head pressure and maximum flow rate for each pump you look at. And these values are shown here on a performance curve. As you can see, it's the very first and last value on the curve and doesn't tell you anything about how the pump actually performs, which is reflected by, well, the whole curve itself. This curve essentially represents every possible flow rate at every possible operating pressure that the pump is capable of. Following the curve, you can see that as operating pressure decreases, flow rate increases, and as operating pressure increases, flow rate decreases, just as in my demonstration earlier. This part of the curve here, shown in yellow, is the part of the curve that's basically the most important for PC water cooling, and that's because it's where most custom loops will fall on the curve due to their rather high pressure drop. As a result, this is the part of the curve that you want to be the strongest. 
Not all pumps have nice smooth performance curves like this example one. Some can be a bit screwy, and some can be augmented in very interesting ways by aftermarket tops. And these augmentations can be beneficial, or they can be detrimental. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have two actual performance curves, one for the stock Lang D5 Basic, and one for the D5 Basic uh, with an old aftermarket top on it that was manufactured by Detroit Thermo. The Detroit Thermo curve is in red, and the stock D5 Basic curve is in blue. You can see that the aftermarket top actually caused a reduction in maximum pressure. However, the top was engineered in such a way as to push this section of the performance curve up and out, causing it to actually outperform the stock D5 Basic in the range at which most water cooling systems usually operate. This is an example of augmenting a pump's performance curve in a way that isn't accurately reflected if you're only looking at the maximum pressure and maximum flow data. Every component in your water cooling setup incurs a pressure drop, regardless of whether it's tubing, water blocks, radiators, or even a flow meter. Now, similar to what we were discussing before, the pressure drop incurred by a given component is dependent upon flow rate, which can make things a little more complicated. But let me demonstrate that relationship. Uh, you can see here I have a water block set up, and I have a line connected to the inlet and the outlet of the water block. Now that inlet and outlet line are connected to this manometer here. What this is measuring is the pressure difference between the inlet and outlet side of the water block. So this will give us the pressure drop incurred by just the water block. Now, as I open the needle valve, uh, that would be closing it. As I open the needle valve, you'll see flow begins to rise. And as the flow rate rises, you can see the pressure drop here begins to increase. Right now it's at 2 PSI, coming up on 3 and so on as I open the valve and increase the flow rate through the system. Now, as the flow rate reaches the two and a, about 2.5, 2.6 gallon a minute mark uh, that it was at when we first visited the system here, you can see that it goes up quite a lot. Let's see, what are we at now? About 7 PSI? Yeah, I think we're going to top out at about 7, 7.2-ish. Uh, and you'll see it bouncing around a bit, and that's partially just because there's still air in the system um, and the pump's flow rate isn't totally constant. And this is a very sensitive piece of equipment. Now, let's jump to a hypothetical uh, pressure drop curve for a component, and I'll show you how that relates to your pump's uh, performance curve. Here's the hypothetical pressure drop curve for either a moderately restrictive component or a somewhat low pressure drop uh, complete system. Like in the demonstration, you can follow along the curve here and see that as flow rate increases, so does pressure drop. While this is all well and good, you're probably wondering what can I do with this pressure drop curve? Well, if you layer a pump's performance curve on top of it, like this, you can use their point of intersection right here to determine the approximate flow rate in a given system. All you have to do is trace a line down from their point of intersection to the x-axis to see the approximate flow rate of the system. At this point, things may still seem a little theoretical. So let's hop on over to a tool that was built by an Extreme Systems member several years ago, Martin M210. All of the concepts that I was mentioning a moment ago can be expressed mathematically. You don't really have to draw a bunch of curves. And that's exactly how Martin's flow rate estimator works. The components list in this flow rate estimator is somewhat outdated, being from 2008, but by adjusting the values for CPU water blocks, GPU water blocks, pumps, radiators, tubing, and any combination thereof, uh, you can experiment with different hypothetical system configurations, and it will give you the approximate flow rate that the, the system will see. Despite being outdated, it's still a great tool to play around with to gain a better understanding for how much each individual component will impact the flow rate of a system. Additionally, if you're feeling really adventurous, you can also dig into the back end of the flow rate estimator and see just exactly how the math works. Well, I hope you found that informative. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll be posting links to all of the resources mentioned in this video in the description box below me. There should be a link to Martin's Liquid Lab, uh, Skinny Labs, and Martin's Flow Rate Calculator. These resources are a little out of date, but it's still useful information and it'll help you gain a greater understanding for how all of these things work together. So go check those out, and uh, bye.